think some of the most compelling words, at least in children's literature, come to us from C.S. Lewis, of course, this being my opinion. But when he describes the curse that the White Witch brought upon Narnia during her rule, Lewis speaks of it this way. It's she that makes it always winter, always winter, and never Christmas. I mean, the reason that line strikes me as powerful is because I remember, at least in my childhood, just how enchanted I was by Christmas and all that surrounded it, how exciting this time of year was, how much anticipation was built into it, how I could hardly sleep at night, and how I would often, you know, try to find out ahead of time what I just might be getting, and how I'd rush, you know, first thing in the morning as early as possible to see what happened to find its way under the tree. I mean, it's not just a glorious day because of all the anticipation of gifts as a child, but Christmas does come to us, and what is one of the uh, busier or more difficult seasons of the year. I mean, especially as a kid, summer has passed and it's not anywhere near in your future. Uh, the days are getting shorter. It's getting darker in the evening. Playtime has ended earlier. The homework is stacking up. The grades are all coming due. And all you have to look forward to for quite some time is more school and more school after that. I mean, the business of life seemed to be at its height at this point of the year. And on top of that, the weather had changed. And, you know, depending on where you grew up, uh, if you grew up in California, this isn't as true. Uh, but, you know, the joys of spring and summer were long past, and autumn kind of played its last little joke on you and showed you color for the last time, you know, for about six months. And then all was gray. You know, and in the middle of that darkness and in the middle of that drudgery, lands Christmas. And as a kid, there's just nothing better, nothing more magical than that. And the lights get put up, the homes are decorated, the presents are wrapped, the treats are made, the family is together. It really is light in the midst of darkness. In fact, I mean, it's been shown that colder, darker, and more dreary cultures, uh, that the peoples of those cultures find Christmas all the more necessary to celebrate. Their traditions are far more elaborate and they make a much bigger deal out of it uh, than maybe we do here in Southern California. But I mean, imagine if there were no Christmas. I mean, imagine if there was no break, it was just instead this gray, lifeless gloom of winter and no bright light coming in the middle of it. I mean, that's what Lewis really wants us to understand or at least feel. And the, the good part is children can feel that. I mean, they know how terrible that would be. I mean, you might have lost your Christmas spirit, uh, but you know this is what at least Lewis is trying to tell us. It speaks to that reality of you know uh, an existence where there is just pain, where there's no hope or no light at the end of the tunnel. The feeling when one gets you know when when things are hard and there's just no end in the foreseeable future. I mean, some of you know that kind of feeling. It's just not that summer's not coming, when I mean, we lost those a long time ago as adults. But there are painful scenarios that seem like they just won't end in this life. And if you think about them too long, it causes all sorts of inner turmoil. I mean, the pain of broken relationships that can't seem to be mended. I mean, this time of year exacerbates that and, and then puts a microscope on it all the more. Or the pain of disease that can't always be cured and doesn't give you a day off, or the pain of the loss you know, of a dear one who isn't here to celebrate any longer, that idea that it's always winter in those regards and never Christmas. And that's a bit dark for a Christmas morning, uh, or at least a Christmas Eve morning, isn't it? But the reason I bring this up is because that's the backdrop of the text that we have this morning that there's only darkness in the foreseeable future. Israel has lived a pretty shoddy existence as far as God is concerned. He's begun to punish her, and her future is even darker than her past, and He has promised her that. And into that dark reality, this word that we hear in Isaiah 9 is spoken, a promise is given that will interrupt what looks like this endless cycle of darkness. And it's so good, the news is so good that it demands a party. 
I mean, that's what God is saying to us. I mean, it's a text we all know. Uh, I'm sure you get it on some cards this time of year, and I do hope by the Spirit of God this morning it will impact us in a fresh way. I mean, the joy of this day would rise from the gift that was given so many years ago. I pray that it would make sense, would provide a framework for all the gifts that will be given, you know, in the next few days based on this reality that really would show you that there's a reason. There is a bright light in the midst of the darkness. And so the first thing I want us to see this morning is a wearying people punished, a wearying people punished. I mean, our text begins, listen to the language, those who walked in darkness and those who walk in the deep darkness. The, the literal translation of that is those who walk in the shadow of death. Uh, that same shadow of death that we know about from Psalm 23, that most famous text, the valley of the shadow of death, it says these people are in dwelling in that, that sort of existence. I mean, the text is written to the, 12 tri uh, the 10 tribes of Israel at this time, the northern kingdom, during a time when their life really just looks like a death march that's about to get worse. I mean, the chapters before ours, chapter 8, uh, read how it ends when you have time this week. Uh, it, it ends where it says, you will see nothing but distress, darkness, and gloom because you have despised me and not obeyed my word. I mean, if that's the preceding to our text, this great word of comfort in chapter 9, if it's preceded by it's just distress, darkness, and gloom, that's your future. As soon as our text is finished, the good news part, uh, immediately following, God ramps up the judgment that he's going to bring on these 10 tribes. He says, if you think it's bad now, just, just wait, it's going to get worse. He says, you're going to try to rebuild your cities, and as soon as you try, I'm going to send in the Syrians and the Philistines, and they're going to tear it down brick by brick. You don't listen to what I say, and so I will not listen to your cries, not even to the cries of your fatherless or your widows. And he says, I'm going to scorch the land, and the people will be like fuel for the fire. I mean, the kind of Bible verses that people avoid uh, because they make God look real bad or sound real angry. Well, these are the verses that are going to follow the text that we're reading this morning. By the end, he says there will be two choices. You have two choices as, as my people. You can either crouch among the prisoners and live there or lay down among the dead and die in the battlefield. It's pretty dark, but what is maybe more difficult is that with every step further down into this descent into the dark abyss, God says, for all of this, his anger is not turned away and his hand is still stretched out. And that's the prophetic way of saying, if you think this is bad, just so you know, God's not tired of punishing you yet. He's not lost his anger. Even though you've received all this discipline, he does not feel like he has gotten his full retribution yet. It's a pretty scary portion of Israel's history. And this is where our text sits. Darkness in front of it, darkness behind it, and then this shining bright light in the middle of it. Israel is a place, Israel is in this place of darkness because of what she has done to God time and time again. She just refuses to listen. And so as she dwells in the valley of the shadow of death, God says, I will not be with you, not as a friend, but I'll be against you. And then all of a sudden, I mean, we're almost assaulted by this good news. And so I want us to see next, a weary world rejoices. Uh, we know that Christmas is a festal day, so, you know, the introductory point we want to get past fairly quick. But we know it's a festal day because our text is a festal text. It's a text that really does demand a party by the end of it. You know, you'll notice that there's joy all over the place, unmixed with uh, any kind of sorrow or darkness. You see it in verses 1 and 3 and following. It goes from, you know, darkness to dancing. It's, it begins in verse 1, but there will be no gloom. 
I mean, consider what we have just heard in chapter 8 and what we'll hear later in chapter 9. He says, at this point in history, no more gloom. There's not going to be any more darkness. In verse 3, you have increased the nation's joy. They're going to rejoice like at harvest time. Now, we aren't in an agrarian society, so this may not mean much to us. But I mean, we can, I'm sure, imagine it. Think of the joy that would come after a full year's worth of labor. You know, you've plowed and you've planted and you've tended and you've protected and you've prayed for weather and you've beat off, you know, varmints and you've, you know, prayed that blight wouldn't come and hit your crops. And now, uh, after all of that year of work, the work is all done. The barns are full. All is well. I mean, you know that you're going to eat and live, but not just that, the, the people you care for, your wife and your children and their children, they'll make it another year. It's a relief. He says what God's going to do is going to bring that kind of joy, the kind of joy that you have when the harvest is in. He says it's like the kind of gladness you get when you divide the spoil after war. I mean, think about that. All the tension and fear of war, if you've ever watched, you know, things like All Quiet on the Western Front or any sort of those movies that really get you into the, the actual darkness and tension of warfare. And not far from you are, are men who've wanted to take your life. And yet far away from you are the ones that you love and for whom you fight. You're hoping and you're praying that you'll get from this place home to that place. There's been no rest, not really. I mean, tension and strain and longing. And then you hear the announcement. It's over. We've won. You know, you can put down your weapons. You're safe now. You're so safe that you can start splitting up the enemy's goods and deciding who gets to keep what. So safe that you can burn your weapons and your uniform, you know, in a huge bonfire. I mean, it's over. I mean, this is the time that you've longed for. It's the time, you know, that Kenny Rogers sang about. Or it's the time, you know, this is the time for counting uh, because the dealing's done. It's all done. Everything is complete. You know, you see this kind of joy and release in miniature, at least in our culture, in, in sports, right? Uh, most of us remember the iconic photo from 1991 of Michael Jordan sitting there hugging and crying over the Larry O'Brien trophy. And that became quite the story because it had been on record just how unemotional, at least with those sorts of emotions, Michael Jordan was. He was just driven. He didn't have time for feelings or emoting. And even his own father said, you know, I've seen him. You know, he won the NCAA championship. He's got a gold medal from the Olympics. He says, and I've never seen him like this before. And so they asked him, you know, what's the deal? Why are you crying? What's with all the emotions? And he said, you know, I'm just happy. Which for someone who has those kind of goals doesn't come very easily or often. And I'm sure it didn't last too long. But it's that kind of happiness, that kind of joy that our text is talking about. It's the kind of joy that goes all the way down to the bones, which if and since this is a Christmas text means that this is a Christmas kind of joy, I mean, the kind of joy at least that we should be experiencing in some measure this time of year. But I mean, how do you get that sort of joy in the midst of the darkness that seems to blanket our text this morning? I mean, how do you go from all of this somewhat, you know, disturbing language between God and this coming judgment and the, the deal that comes because man can't quite get it right, to dancing and throwing away your weapons and, you know, acting a fool and just having a good time. You know, how do you move from one to the other without getting whiplash, uh, as often happens in the prophets? Or what's the cause from going from this sort of mourning to this sort of rejoicing? Well, according to our text, the cause is Christmas presents. Um, the children probably get this again. Children, none of you have gotten to open your presents yet, have you? 
No, I'm seeing a lot of no's. That's good. If there's any yeses, I'm going to talk to your parents later. But you don't care if you open them, right? I mean, it's not a big deal if tomorrow we decide to do something different than open Christmas presents or maybe the next day decide the same. Uh, I mean, if you are like me, when I was your age anyway, uh, it's probably killing some of you uh, that you have to wait a whole 24 hours, at least some of you do, to open your gifts. But the joy, the joy that comes when the waiting's over, that feels pretty good. A whole day just to play with your new stuff. Well, that's what our text is about. It's about that kind of joy, and that kind of joy is brought about, apparently, by Christmas presents. I mean, everything moves because of gifts given in this text, and you'll see that in our last point this morning. An unwearied, zealous, gift-giving God. An unwearied, zealous, gift-giving God. Listen to the language, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And that is it right there. That really is everything. And we have just seen in the text before this, the closed fist of an angry God striking out against his own people. And that same God telling us that as much as he's punished them, he's not out of energy yet. He has not punched himself tired. And that same hand comes in this text, and it starts coming at us full speed, and then it opens and out drops a gift for mankind, for us, for his people. The gift of a baby. Now, that's strange. Can you imagine, I mean, you're in the midst of being told that things are going to go from bad to worse around here. You know, if you think it's bad now, just wait till next week. You know, things are going to be full of warfare, and there's going to be poverty, and there's going to be hunger. You're not going to be knowing where your next meal is coming from. You're either going to be in prison or you're going to be dead on the battlefield. And God says, but I've got the perfect thing for you at this time in your life. Here's a baby. You know, that's not usually what we're looking for when we're looking for relief. And don't get me wrong, I love children as much as the next guy. I mean, I love my children as much as the next guy. Maybe not yours, no. Um, They are indeed a blessing from the Lord. But in times of distress and warfare, the idea that you're bringing another life into the world while all are in danger is hardly, or at least seems hardly, like good news. I mean, if you're broke, it's hardly a solution to your poverty. Uh, If you're tired, it doesn't seem to answer the questions of your weariness. I mean, if you look deep in the eyes of the young parents around you, you will see that it is not an answer to that kind of question. But it's what God gives, and that's why we're here this morning. Because the only thing that's stronger than God's wrath against sin is His love and His zeal to save sinners, to rescue, to give to you that which you could not get for yourself. Notice what the last verse and uh, last uh, sentence in cha- uh, 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 verse seven says: "The zeal of the Lord of Hosts will perform this, will do this." And that is why this baby is born, because God is zealous, because He's promised to do this, to do this for you. Notice the text, the only thing that changes is God. Not Israel. I mean, you don't see in this text, there's no big repentance, there's no big shift, there's not a new game plan, uh, there's not someone that finally figured it out in the nation. God is angry, and then there's a change, and the change is all based on God and His doing. Not on anything the people have done or said. There's just a God who gives, a God who acts. Notice, those who are sitting in darkness, a light will shine on them. Something will come from the outside in. He says again, God will multiply you. He will increase your joy. He will break the oppressor's yoke. Because he is zealous, he will do all of it. And that is why this child is given. Because this child is God himself. 
And he's here to do it all. I mean, he will fight the enemy. He will obey the Father that we could not obey. He will even quench God's wrath, so much so that God has no more wrath to give, that it will all be poured out on this one. For God so loved the world that he gave. You see, lying in this manger is God's great act of war and salvation. I mean, this baby holds the key to peace on earth. I mean, the real kind of peace where people can put their guns away once and for all, turn them into gardening tools because they just don't need them for that sort of protection anymore. I mean, it's the kind of peace where you can leave your car unlocked and your house unlocked because you know your neighbors are good people and they wouldn't ever want to harm you. I mean, it's the kind of prosperity where you never have to wonder how you're going to pay for Christmas this year. Uh, or, you know, if the job will be there when it's all over. It's the kind of salvation that you can say to your doctor, you know, it's been wonderful having this relationship with you, but I no longer will need your services. But how? I mean, how does a baby answer all those questions? Because this child was born to save sinners. Because God put on human flesh to do what we could not do. I mean, sin is the reason that your relationships get ruined. It's the reason your stuff gets broken. It's the reason that you run out of money. It's the reason your body's in pain. It's the reason maybe that your marriage is in shambles and your children rebel and your parents are difficult to deal with. Sin is what causes every problem known to mankind, which is why there is no paint-by-the-numbers solution to fix it which is why we see time and time again throughout the whole testimony of Scripture, man can't get it right. And so God comes as a man to do what we could not do. I mean, sin is the reason we go to war. It's the reason politicians pretend and posture but have no lasting solutions. And worst of all, it's the reason that God will judge all men, the living and the dead. You see, it's been casting its long shadow of darkness over creation since the fall of man. Until this particular fateful day, when there was a child born in Bethlehem, and light broke out in the midst of darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. I mean, had that child not been born, our humanity, our existence would have been one that was always winter and never Christmas. But with the birth of this son, for once, it's truly Christmas. I mean, Lewis really is getting at the heart of this. There will be no more gloom, our text says in verse 1. That will be finished. The war is over. The battle is won. Peace has been made once and for all between God and man. And because of that, all is well. You see, because Christ has come and put on flesh, because he has done what we cannot do, it will not always be winter. Because there was Christmas, we can be assured that all will be made right, that the things that currently cloak our humanity, that are broken in this world, will be put to rights once and for all when this God who became man comes again and does, so for our, does this on our behalf. But even now, even today, we can celebrate before we see the final product because God entered history. And that light that shone out on that day will not stop shining until we see God and his presence and his glory and the knowledge of the Lord filling the earth, even as the waters cover the sea. And because of that, we can say to one another, Merry Christmas. And truly we can say, come, let us adore him. For this is our God, a God who gives and gives zealously because he loves sinners zealously. Let's pray.